In 1834, 175 years ago, a gleeful crowd cheered and whooped as fire destroyed the old Palace of Westminster. It was an awesome spectacle, the greatest fire to hit our capital city between the Great Fire of London and the Blitz of World War II, and it swept away a historic but squalid complex of medieval buildings that had housed Parliament, the Commons and the Lords for centuries. The hand-pumped fire engines of the day were powerless to prevent the destruction of a sizeable chunk of British history. This is the story of how accident and incompetence succeeded where Guy Fawkes had failed and how thousands of people, huge crowds, gathered to watch as the centuries-old seat of the British Parliament burned down. Behind its recently added 19th century facade, the old palace remained the chaotic, unplanned, rat-infested collection of medieval buildings and jerry-built additions that had been gifted to Parliament by the boy king Edward VI. In those days the Commons met as it had for centuries in St Stephen's Chapel, once the chapel of the royal household. The first MPs had turned the pews sideways to face one another, setting the template for our party system in the process. This was the chamber of Pitt and Peel and Walpole, the chamber invaded by King Charles I and his soldiers when he attempted to arrest five dissident MPs in the build-up to the Civil War only to be told by the Speaker in one of the great scenes of parliamentary history that he had not eyes to see nor tongue to speak, but as the House was pleased to direct him. Leaving the monarch to retreat from the chamber, pursued by cries from the MPs of privilege, privilege. So it's a pretty cramped small chamber, which of course it had to be because there was no amplification. I mean, people really did make speeches then. They really threw their voices. Uh, but it, it was small for, for obviously practical reasons. You had, I think, in excess of 700 members of Parliament uh, at the time of the fire of 1834. The cramped conditions weren't the only problem. The stench of the open sewer that was the 19th century River Thames poured through those great windows. At night, the fumes from the candles made the air unbreathable. In the parliamentary archives here in the Victoria Tower, where Old Acts of Parliament written on great rolls of vellum are stacked on the shelves. The parliamentary historian Philip Salmon told me the MPs of the era had long been dissatisfied, but they'd rejected numerous schemes to move somewhere more salubrious. The Old Palace and the Commons in particular had long been considered very, very much unfit for purpose. They were very cramped. Uh, the Commons chamber itself measured just 57 feet by about 32 feet. In fact, most pictures from the time make it look a lot larger than it actually was. What actually happens is that on the grounds of cost and on the grounds of taste, all of these proposals are rejected. But in 1801, when 100 extra Irish MPs come and sit uh, at Westminster, that sort of forces the issue. They also, at that time, begin to build a whole series of other buildings around St Stephen's Chapel. It's the smoking rooms, committee rooms, corridors, there's the famous library that's built. And so, actually, many of the buildings that are destroyed in 1834 are actually fairly new buildings, many of them wooden, and it's often thought that they're all old, but they're not. The fire was caused by a decision to declutter. Vast quantities of old tally sticks were taking up valuable space and it was decided to get rid of them. A few tally sticks are still preserved in the parliamentary archive. Well, Caroline, the, these, are, these are what started all. These are these mysterious exchequer tally sticks. What exactly are they? Right, well, the exchequer was the medieval finance office which was on site at Westminster uh, for many centuries. Um, and the way that tallies worked were they were a way of um, identifying debts that were owed to the government. Um, so let's just have a, a look at them. On here. Make sure we don't damage them in any way when we handle them. So what do we got? Right, so a tally is a, uh, a piece of hazelwood or boxwood that's been shaped into a rectangle um, and then notches would be marked onto... Mm -hmm. Uh, the side of the stick to indicate the amount of money that was owed to the government. 
um, and you can see a few little notches there. Um, and then the tally would be split down the middle, leaving a little stalk at this end, and the smaller part would be kept by the Exchequer Office, and the larger part here uh, would be given to the debtor. And when the debt was paid and the money came back to Westminster, this part of the tally would be sent with it, and it would be matched up, tallied up, an expression we still use today, uh, with the smaller piece. And because the uh, indented carved bit had been split down the middle, it was a, a unique way of showing that this hadn't been forged in any way. This is the equivalent of the Inland Revenue database today, in effect. Pretty much. Uh, yes, exactly. It was, a, it was a record of all the debts that were owed to the government and that had been paid. And when the fire came, there were, even though these were out of use by that time, there were, there were cartloads of these. There were two large cartloads of these left over. The Exchequer had been abolished in 1826, but uh, there was still an accumulation of these sticks left at Westminster. So, so lots and lots of old, dry yes, wood. Yes, perfect firewood, in <laughs> fact. The, the, the perfect fire hazard. And exactly. It was decided to burn them. Mr Webley, the clerk of works, decided that the neighbours would be upset if they were simply heaped in Old Palace Yard and set on fire. So instead he detailed two workmen, Joshua Cross and Patrick Furlong, to feed them into the furnaces in the cellars which heated the garish splendours of the House of Lords. The work went on all day and they were supposed to be careful not to stoke the flames too high. But witnesses later described them throwing in great handfuls of tally sticks onto an astonishing blaze. By the afternoon, the housekeeper, Mrs Wright, was complaining in the Chamber of the Lords that it was... ..in a great smother and the throne could scarcely be seen. A visitor who stood in Black Rod's box, the scarlet curtained enclosure to the right of this picture, recalled... The heat was so great, I said, bless me, how warm it is here. I felt it through my boots. Cross and Furlong knocked off late in the afternoon. Mrs Wright locked up the chamber at five. By six, it was ablaze. I think it was a, an accident that uh, had been expected and predicted. In fact, only the previous year, a committee of the House had looked into the, the structure of, of the rebuilding that, that they were doing at the time to try and in, improve small parts of the accommodation. And they had noted on the ventilation systems and the heating systems that they were very unsafe. Um, the flues hadn't been swept for a year, and this was another cause for concern. So, and there had been all sorts of fire uh, warnings in the past. So it wasn't terribly unexpected. It still happens today. People do put things on the fire. Um, and if you put too much on and they get too much of a blaze on and they haven't swept the chimneys, which apparently they hadn't done for sort of many a year here, once the fire gets a hole in the chimney, if it takes a hold on any of the timbers which come through, then we're going to get spread of fire sort of laterally along those timbers. <laughs> One witness very close to the action was Francis Rickman, whose father was the assistant clerk to the Commons. The family lived in a house in the palace complex, adjoining Westminster Hall. Papa at first thought it could be got under, but soon it fearfully grew and we had little doubt the hall would catch. Then the flames burst from the House of Commons windows, and sooner than I could believe, the interior of that was destroyed. Red smoke rises from the quadrangle, and the open Houses of Commons arches, ruined like Fountain's Abbey, are filled with an orange light. Nearly the whole of the south end of the speakers is destroyed. As word spread, it seemed that every artist and diarist in London hurried to Westminster to join the throng who were enjoying the spectacle. The crowd was rather pleased than otherwise, hewed and whistled when the breeze came, as if to encourage it. There's a flare-up for the House of Lords, a judgment for the Poor Law Bill. There go their acts. Such exclamations seem to be the prevailing ones. A man sorry I did not anywhere see. Many of the ministers were on the spot. Melbourne, Palmerston, Althorpe, Auckland, Hophouse, all standing like stuck pigs without attempting to do anything to prevent the confusion and mismanagement, which was great. The very mob seemed to care little for the destruction of the other buildings, on which they vented their low and reckless jests. But the feeling of anxiety was almost universal for the preservation of the noble hall. 
Then as now, the buildings of Parliament were dominated by the vast bulk of Westminster Hall, the greatest medieval hall in Europe. And as the flames began to consume St Stephen's Chapel, the place where the House of Commons sat, which would have been about there in the modern building, as the flames consumed that medieval chapel, the Chancellor, Lord Althorpe, shouted out his famous command to the firefighters. Damn the House of Commons, let it blaze away, but save, oh, save the hall! And at his command, swarms of firefighters climbed the walls of Westminster Hall, far better loved than the House of Commons, to soak the great medieval timbers which supported the vast sweep of its roof against the approaching flames. So did their desperate efforts indeed save the hall, or was it simply luck? I, I think it was the, the fact that the wind did change, it took the fire away. Um, the amount of combustible materials that were in there were probably very limited as well, um, apart from the roof. They were very fortunate, I've seen the pictures of sort of, sort of ladders going up all over, um, sort of new, no disregard to any health and safety laws or anything like that, people perched everywhere sort of getting this uh, water about. And it probably helped to save the building as it was. Well, of course, the crown jewel of Parliament is the Westminster Hall, and that did survive. And sometimes I've left here very late at night when there's only emergency lighting in the Great Hall and nobody else about, and I walk through that Great Hall, and I can tell you their hairs on the back of my neck stand up. This is not an eerie sight, but you get a feeling of... Uh, continuity, you realise that on this site, covered by the roof which still survives, this uh, roof of sort of, I think, seven or eight hundred years old, on this site some of the great constitutional events have taken place. The trial of Guy Fawkes, Braveheart, William Wallace, and uh, the great trial of Charles I took place there. So uh, you cannot help but walking through that wonderful hall and, and feeling a great sense of history. One of the relics rescued from the fire was the ultimate product of the trial of Charles I, the King's death warrant, complete with Oliver Cromwell's signature, with his seal and those of his colleagues. The old Speaker's house, tucked in beside Westminster Hall, was badly damaged in the fire. Its replacement contains more keepsakes of the destroyed House of Commons. And the current speaker, John Burko, lives and works amongst them. And that's it there, then. This is the great table. Let's go and have a look. It's huge. It is very large. I think most people looking at it would say that it's very impressive. We have here what look to be the sockets or base of the brackets for the mace. We imagine really that, that uh, in, in the middle of a fire people could have just uh, run in and quickly <laughs> grab this and run away with it. It's enormous. I mean, it's it's enormously very heavy. heavy. I think it's been estimated that it would take several people, possibly as many as 20 people, to carry and shift it. It's an enormously weighty table. So the, the heels have obviously sort of There are over rather there. notable heel marks there and the interesting thing is that they do seem to be just at one side. Shoes or some other heavy item you can just rested imagine. upon them and fairly badly scratched them because the rest of the base is pretty much untouched. I see. But how do you feel about the thought that, you know, Palmerston or Pitt or Peel or someone pounded on this table once upon a time? Well, it's a magnificent thought and it can't be demonstrated, but it certainly has a grandeur about it. Yes. Back in the parliamentary archives, more treasures are preserved. We believe that this 1562 Cramner Bible uh, was the Bible that was on the table of the House of Lords Chamber and which peers used to take their oaths when they were admitted to Parliament. Uh, you can mm. see this amazing 16th century print, um, but there are That's parts weird. around the edge which were badly burnt and have been cut away and restored. So it's a bit mangled at the edges. It's but... a bit mangled at the edges, but um, 
very atmospheric as well. This is, in fact, an account book from the Sandra and Arms Department going right up to the day before the fire. Um, and it's also been restored, but you Ooh, can, yeah, can you see, that that's see inside that uh, it was very damaged. heavily damaged um, by the fire. But because it showed all the payments being made to staff in the House of Commons um, right up until the fire, uh, mm, they decided that. that they needed to keep it. So mm. they did that, and um, that's how it survives now. And besides the Great Hall, a few other fragments of the medieval palace have survived. These Gothic cloisters, one of the hidden jewels of Parliament, normally close to the public, and just beside them, the chapel under the old Commons chamber. Ah, the chapel survived. The chapel, St Mary's the Undercroft. Uh, and that really was wonderful, because above it was the old House of Commons. If you remember the, the king's medieval chapel, his place of worship, that was gutted. But the structural integrity of the Mer St Mary's the Undercroft survived. And uh, the Victorians rightly decided it should return to its original purpose as a place of worship. And therefore today we have this lovely place for private prayer and reflection. It's not a museum piece, it's not part of the tourist trail, uh, and uh, of course it's a living church. The children of members of parliament and the grandchildren of members of parliament can be baptised there and their marriage is blessed there. William Hague had his marriage blessed there and uh, uh, Charles Kennedy and many others. And uh, in fact my daughter's going to be married there. Uh, so it's a very lovely place for, for all of us and we're very proud of it. But it survived the fire of 1834. That's, that's, the, that's the great surprise and the great treasure part of it. Much else did not. And in the days after the fire, the artists were back to capture the aftermath as workmen labored to shore up the tottering structure and establish temporary chambers for Lords and Commons. And there was one more eminent visitor, the old king, William IV, who seized on the opportunity to try and dispose of an unloved royal residence. He immediately rushed to the scene the next day. The reports, he went through all the rubble, uh, quite sort of taking risks and looking at everything, and then offered Buckingham House, as it then was, um, which was nearly complete at the time, as a new seat for Parliament. Um, he repeatedly pressed ministers about this, particularly the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. And in the end, Lord Melbourne had to be quite sort of strict with him and say, absolutely not. And the usual reason that's given for this is that by this time, uh, there's a sort of historic sentimentality about staying on the same site. Historians talk about the politics of place, the genius of place, about maintaining these links with our ancient constitution by staying at Westminster. This is Lord Melbourne to the King, the 1st of November 1834. He says, there can be no question, as your majesty states, it is your majesty's undoubted prerogative to appoint the place of meeting of your parliament. But if the two houses of parliament are rebuilt in the same quarter of the town in which they have stood so long, their present character, form and extent may be in a great degree preserved. If a total removal takes place, i.e. to Buckingham House, to a situation where space is unlimited, it will be very difficult to avoid providing much larger accommodation for spectators as well as for members. And Viscount Melbourne need not recall the fatal effects which large galleries filled with the multitude have had upon the deliberation of public assemblies and upon the laws and institutions of nations. That's a very strong anti-democratic statement. In other words, keep it small, keep it at Westminster. There's, there's not enough room for the public. Uh, keep the chamber small. I mean, if they had moved to Buckingham House, uh, all the MPs could have been accommodated, uh, making, of course, absenteeism far less acceptable. Uh, public access would have been unrestricted. And maybe a very different style of politics uh, would have emerged and given a different shape to the type of politics we have today. Instead, it was decided to hold a competition to design a new Palace of Westminster, and the rival proposals flooded in. The, the competition um, came about really as a, a public protest against the idea that the sole remaining architect at the Board of Works, a man called Robert Smirk, whose work wasn't very highly regarded, would be in charge of you know, rebuilding and redesigning the new structure. Um, and out of that, and out of the fact that many people hated him, came this sort of public competition. Uh, the first public competition that I'm aware of for a national sort of heritage site on this type of, of scale. Um, it had to be 
built in an Elizabethan and Gothic style. I think that's crucial. Uh, many historians have pointed to the need to uh, identify with the past, to protect an image of stability at a time of sort of unprecedented social and political turmoil, hence the decision to build in an Elizabethan or Gothic style. Charles Barry's romantic Gothic design, configured around the ceremonial of the state opening, was the runaway winner. And as Melbourne had suggested, it provided only limited space for the public and the press. So it was that the new Houses of Parliament rose from the ashes of the old, that forgotten hotchpotch replaced by one of the most recognisable buildings in the world.